My Antonia is the third book in Willa Cather's Great Plains series of novels. The first, O Pioneers, was written in 1913. The second, The Song of the Lark, was written in 1915. And My Antonia was written in 1918. To me, it's by far the best of the three. I've read all three. The first two I don't remember much of, but I keep coming back to My Antonia again and again. And I think partially because it doesn't read like fiction to me, but reads like memoir. In fact, I would say that it is memoir before memoir existed as a genre. Now, of course, people have always written autobiography and have always written memoirs, but normally famous people in normally at the end of their lives, especially at that time, the 1920s and the early um, 19 teens. Okay, and Willa Cather wrote My Antonia when she was 47 years old. She still had a lot of uh, great books to write ahead of her. In fact, another very, very good book that I would recommend by Willa Cather is called Death Comes to the Archbishop. But let's focus on My Antonia. I think that Will or the fictional narrator, Jim Burden, great fictional last name, by the way, what is his burden? Well, I would say his burden is an idyllic childhood. Nothing after his full, enriched childhood and adolescence lives up to that. Everything pales. Everything is a kind of slight disappointment. And I think that he is a stand-in for her. Now, what are the parallels between the two characters? Well, both of them moved from Virginia to a small town in Nebraska when they were about 10 years old in the 1880s. The fictional town is called Black Hawk, and the actual town was called Red Cloud. It had about a thousand people in it. Jim Burden was an orphan. Will Cather was not. But Jim Burden being an orphan doesn't really factor into the story at all. I would say it's just a throwaway detail. Um, both of them uh, loved books. That's how they killed time, let's say. They both taught themselves Latin in high school. They both went to Lincoln, Nebraska for college. They both finally ended up in New York in long-term relationships, but childless ones. It's true that Jim Burden is a man and Willa Cather was a woman, but Willa Cather lived for 39 years with a magazine editor called Edith Lewis. They're actually buried together in a small cemetery in New Hampshire. Also, in her adolescence, she was rebellious. She was an unapologetic, unabashed tomboy who occasionally dressed in men's clothes. Other things that make it seem like a memoir to me. Well, there's no plot, really. It's episodic. There's very little dialogue. There are very few stretches of dialogue. I don't know if there are any stretches of dialogue. There is some dialogue and it's very, very poignant, but it just, there are these moments of dialogue that do such a wonderful job of like drawing character efficiently with one line. We'll get to that. Um, uh, also, it's elegiac. It's about something lost. Ch a childhood, a time, what is that time? Well, that time is, like I say, 1880s in the Great Plains when white people first started to settle into this frontier land. A lot of them were immigrants from old Europe. Um, about the time that she wrote My Antonia, she wrote a piece of literary criticism in which she complained about, at that time, contemporary fiction being overfurnished. And she also wrote somewhere else that she thought the most formative years for writers were the years between the ages of 8 and 15. Well, basically with my Antonia, she broke down a book to writing about just those years, or no, not just those years, but those are the years that form Jim Burden. Those are the years that give him a kind of attitude on life and a, and a perspective, okay? And it's really just reduced to that, okay? The language is also very simple and straightforward and direct too, just as 
Well, let me just say this. If you get the book, you have to be sure that you get the version where there is the longer introduction, okay? In that introduction, right, Willa Cather, this is especially clear in the longer one, meets this old friend from Black Hawk, Nebraska on the train and they bond over their memories of this bohemian girl, Antonia, how much she represented that time in that country. And in the longer version, Willa Cather challenges Jim Burden to write about his experiences with Antonia because he was closest to her. And in the longer version, Jim Burden says to her, he says, I should have to do it in a direct way and say a great deal about myself. It was through myself that I knew and felt her, which I think says a ton about what memoir is. And then there's also a great moment in both of the introductions. I recommend the longer introduction because it gives a, a few more details about Jim Burden's life in New York City and it adds to the elegiac tone, okay? Um, but there's a great moment in both of the introductions where just before Jim Burden, he finishes the manuscript and he gives it to Willa Cather. And just before he gives it to her, he looks at the title on the portfolio and it says Antonia and he puts my before it. Okay, which again, I think speaks to what memoir is, right? It, the portrait comes to life thanks to the portrait artist, okay? The portrait artist, memoirists in a way are portrait artists of people and of places and of times. Okay, there are a couple things about this book in addition to it being elegiac that I wanna point out. And I think work in concert with its elegiac tone to make it great. By the way, I should say that what first drew me to the book years ago was F. Scott Fitzgerald's praise for it. In fact, that he felt that The Great Gatsby, which we all know is another great, gorgeous, elegiac book, he didn't think it stood up to my Antonia. Also, the great literary critic H. L. Mencken considered it just an exemplar piece of literature. Um, one thing I want to point out is how well it describes landscapes. I've never been a fan of what my father used to call weather reports. But when they're done well, when they're done simply, really there's nothing better. And I have the book here so that I can read some of these passages to you. What she did in this book is she described the Great Plains almost as kind of this moving, living thing. It's active. It swells and sways beneath the characters and the action. Let me give you some examples so that you can see what I mean. Okay, here's the first one, right? So Jim Burton goes out there and is sort of blown away by these landscapes. He's a 10 year old kid. He's living with his grandparents and he'd go out, he'd go out to the garden and he would just be stunned at what he saw. And this is one of the things he writes, okay, or he thinks. As I looked about me, I felt that the grass was the country as the water is the sea. The red of the grass made all the great prairie the color of wine stains or of certain seaweeds when they are first washed up. And there was so much motion in it. The whole country seemed somehow to be running. Do you see what I mean? Or check this out because there's this other scene where he, it's the end of the day, right? And he's looking out from his grandparents' garden. I kept as still as I could. Nothing happened. I did not expect anything to happen. I was something that lay under the sun and felt it like the pumpkins. And I did not want to be anything more. I was entirely happy. Perhaps we feel like that when we die and become a part of something entire, whether it is sun and air or goodness and knowledge. At any rate, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. When it comes to one, it comes as naturally as sleep. In fact, right, that line, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great is etched 
onto Willa Cather's tombstone. The book is filled with wonderful descriptions like that. I mean, there's one that I have in mind where, I don't know, just the, her description of rain, where she writes, the felty beat of the raindrops on the soft dust of the barnyard. I can hear that, man. I can hear that. But again, it's more than just beautiful descriptions of landscapes. There are great characters. All of them are described distinctly. Antony, of course, who represents for Jim Burden and for so many people the spirit of this place. There's her father. There's her mother. There's her brother. All of them are distinct characters. There is Jim Burden's grandmother and his grandfather. Again, I talked about the sparseness of dialogue, but when it's there, it's poignant and it's telling. There's this great line of dialogue when Jim Burden's grandmother stands up for Antonia's little sister before their kind of autocratic, cruel mother. And there's also this prayer that Jim Burden's grandfather gives after Antonia's father commits suicide. I mean, <laughs> it's perfect dialogue, although it's spare and sparse. Also, she's a great storyteller. There's scenes where, you know, Jim Burden earns Antonia's respect by killing this huge rattlesnake or these two characters, Peter and Pavel, who have escaped Russia in disgrace and come to the Great Plains and before one of them dies, they tell Antonia the reason for this disgrace. I won't ruin it for you. But just remember the wolves, man, the wolves. It's stunning, stunning writing, unforgettable writing. And then later on when, you know, Jim goes off to Lincoln, Nebraska and meets up with Lena Lingard, who we'll talk about, and they go to see these plays, this theater. And just the way that Willa Cather describes the two of them, or Jim Burden describes them watching this badly acted great play and just reminded me of how when we're young, we're just so much more receptive to art, even when it's not really executed well. Like right now, it's very, very hard for me, not very hard for me to enjoy a work of art unless it's executed perfectly. That wasn't the case when I was young, man. Another thing I want to point out about this book is this kind of undertone of what I would call eroticism. I don't think that there is a kiss in this book that's described with any gusto, certainly not, but there is a kind of celebration a kind of visceral celebration of the female body in action in this book. About the joy that it can give, let's say, through its vitality. Okay, and I want to read a bit from the book to back up this statement. Okay, check this out. Antony was a great storyteller, first of all. And so this is Jim Burden describing her voice. Her voice had a peculiarly engaging quality. It was deep, a little husky, and one always heard the breath vibrating behind it. Everything she said seemed to come right out of her heart. Or check out this. Jim Burden would go to these dances, right? Where all the hired girls would come, right? The hired girls were the girls from European countries who lived on the farms on the outskirts, and they would later be hired by the more well-to-do American families to do housework and take care of the kids. And these characters are the characters that carry this vitality that Willa Cather celebrates in the book, okay? So Jim Burden would go to these dances, and this is him describing what it was like to dance with the American girls, not the hired girls, okay? When one danced with them, their bodies never moved inside their clothes. Their muscles seemed to ask but one thing, 
not to be disturbed. Also, there's another of the hired girls called Lena Lingard, and there's just, just this great description of an erotic dream that Jim Burden has about her. Okay, Lena Lingard is this woman who drives all the men mad in the countryside. They just go out to watch her, right? Watch her cows, okay? Check out this description of an erotic dream. I was in a harvest field full of shocks and I was lying against one of them. Lena Lingard came across the stubble barefoot in a short skirt with a curved reaping hook in her hand, and she was flushed like the dawn, with a kind of luminous rosiness all about her. She sat down beside me, turned to me with a soft sigh, and said, now they are all gone, and I can kiss you as much as I like. And finally, there's this just wonderful scene near the end of the book, when Jim Burden is about to leave for college, and he meets one final time with the hired girls for a picnic. They invite him to go out on a picnic. And he gets there early. And like I said, the, the landscapes of the Great Plains sort of double for Antonia and the hired girls. He gets there early and he decides that he's gonna skinny dip in this river where he used to hunt with his friend Charlie or Charles. And he's swimming in this river and he's describing what's around him and then these girls show up and he stands up out of the water. I mean, they don't, Willa Cather doesn't say that he's skinny dipping, but you get the sense that's what he's doing. He strips himself down. He stands up out of excitement upon seeing them arrive in the horse-drawn carriage. And he says to them, how pretty you look, right? And they all say, and you too. And then just erupt in peals of laughter. Again, man, it's just the purest form of true eroticism, in my opinion. Okay, just to say some few final things, right? Neither Jim Burden nor Antonia ever really live up to their <clears throat> early promise for family and domestic bliss, okay? Jim Burden, as I say, ends up childless in a kind of loveless marriage, and my, and Antonia, her marriage isn't loveless, but she's sort of like withered by work. And she gets married to this immigrant guy who kind of saves her from disgrace because she has a child out of wedlock. She ends up having so many children, all right? She's the opposite of Jim Burden in this sense, having so many children that she can't even remember their birthdays, okay? But you know, this is the sadness of it, right? It's like you almost feel, although Antonia is a few years older than Jim Burden, that they were kind of, they should have been together. So that always throbs beneath the book, like what we could have been, what we should have been. And you know, Jim Burden is a bit too conventional to pull her out of this disgrace after she has this child out of wedlock. Okay, you know, there's this one scene near the end of the book where Antonia is recalling the old days in the old country and is describing to Jim Burden how much she enjoyed listening to his, her father talk to his friends. And she would say, it was beautiful talk, like what I never hear in this country. And Jim Burden asks her, well, what did they talk about? And she says this great thing, right? Simple but great. She says, I don't know about music and the woods, and about God, and about when they were young, right? That's really what this book, My Antonia, is about. That's what it's about, you know? The book starts with a quote, or there's a quote at the beginning in Latin, from Virgil, <clears throat> and um, the quote in English is, the best days are the first to flee. Speaking of elegiac. And then later on, Jim Burden, who quotes this line, quotes another line from Virgil, where he says, I shall be the first if I live to bring the muse into my country. And then Jim Burden comments, or Willa Cather comments through Jim Burden, that this was not a boast, it was a hope. 
that it was said with humility. And really, okay, that is what Willa Cathar has done with my Antonia. She has brought the muse into her country. And by country, another thing that Willa Cather points out through Jim Burden is her part of the world, her time. Again, man, I, <laughs> I say this about all my favorite books, right? But I just can't recommend this one enough. I mean, I've already read it probably five or six times. I'm sure I'll go back to it again. I just don't, I can't tire of it. You know, it just seems so filled with vitality and I guess, obviously, I can relate to it. Perhaps my years between 8 and 15 were also the years that most defined my perspective of life. And although I didn't maybe live those years as fully as I might have, you know, again, that kind of aching, yearning to be able to live them again, it seems to um, sort of drive me in present day. And maybe that's one of the reasons why this book strikes me so much um, as the best possible kind of memoir.